Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. We're back. The Flames came back with a vengeance this week in one of their games. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, it's weird to have these weeks where we're breaking down two games, isn't it? Yeah, it the whole thing the, since the beginning of December has just been bizarro world, frankly. Well, let's jump into this week's Bizarro World. The Flames played two games. They had a f- what one, two, three, four, five day break um, before this game, and then they on the thirteenth they took on the Ottawa Senators here at the Dome. Ended up losing five four to one to Ottawa. Now the Flames had uh, this is their first home game since December eleventh, and Ottawa had played one game in twenty five days. But no matter what excuse you you make, uh, this was not a great outing. No, um, it it looked basically like how they played against Tampa or Florida or Carolina, but the quality of their opponent was significantly less good. My thought on that one was, you know what? It's one thing to lose three in a row to some of the top teams in the East when they're on the road trip, and that's one thing. But then to come home and lose this badly to a cellar dweller is not a great look. No, and, like, how would you say it? I can give excuses for, um, like, COVID and getting over it and, you know, not being up to snuff endurance-wise, but, you know, like, at the end of the day, that becomes an excuse where, yeah, okay, but you're also not alone. And, like, Ottawa had only played two games in, the, like, a very long time. Yeah. Like, that was their second game in a long time. And, you know, like, it, there's not really any excuse um, other than, like, they just didn't put the effort in and thought that they could walk over them. Much like they did last year when they only won two or three of the nine games against the Senators. And this looked like the Flames team of old, where they started okay, and then they, I think, you know, Nick Paul scored on them in the first goal, and they just fell apart. It's like, you know, what we've seen from this team for how many years you and I have been doing the show now of, well, the, you know, the things got tough, and we just stopped playing. Yeah, and instead of buckling down like they had been early in the season of, okay, you scored on us, congrats. Now it's time for us to go mop the floor with you. And... You know, um, it, that level of intensity hasn't been there uh, since they came back from COVID. But, you know, it, it's frustrating because, like, under normal circumstances, like, the level of critique of the team would be a lot more intense because of the fact that, you know, like, come on, guys. But we don't know how each specific player is responding from recovering from COVID. And that kind of throws a little bit of a wrench into things. And, but at the yeah. same time, it's been how long since this team's been playing again? If guys aren't responding, they should be changing their line accordingly. Like that's one re that's one concern I have there is they really haven't changed the lineup. And if you've got a guy who's not doing well, you got to change up that lineup and, you know, get that guy um, maybe playing less minutes or sit him out for a couple games. Yeah, and it, it's one of those delicate balance situations, and it's one of those where, like, I think that just having more practice days and more skating drills and just, like, physically having the ability to work out, frankly, will help the team. And, like, there was a significant gap between the Senators game and the next one against Florida, and the difference between the effort levels between shift to shift the period to period game to game was noticeably different in the Florida game and I think that just the having the extra handful of days and workouts plus more than likely Daryl Sutter kind of not being pleased <laughs> and probably being home as well yeah, like all of those factors, I think, was what led to what happened against Florida. This uh, Ottawa game, before we leave it, this looked like it might have been, and this was a weird stat to me until I looked it up, this could have been the first time this year the Flames had been shut out. They've yet to be shut out this season, and they got pretty close in this one, but thankfully Matthew Kachuk scored a goal um, to to make sure they didn't. 
you were mentioning Daryl Sutter, and Daryl Sutter said after this game that the team is still struggling with adversity, which is, we know, something that he talked about last year when he took over the job, and that the team lacked energy and emotion in this game. So um, some of the players were asked about that as well, but I think, you know, it was very much going through the motions. Yeah, and, like, it, it's hard because of the fact that, like, with so many days off and like the schedule being bonkers and games being canceled it's hard to get into a regular rhythm plus then you have the stands being half empty and 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 like it, it's hard mm-hmm. to deal Pro with all of these are things very used to having structure they're very yeah. used to being constantly busy and having a lot of structure yeah and it's hard to go from like you're playing every other day or every third day to okay well we're playing like four games in a month and it's like um what what huh what like you're just not used to that level of change and like it it would be different like in the ahl where you're only playing on the weekends because you get into that routine but you know it's just it's very hard for anybody to completely adapt to a frankly bizarre and unique situation and be at the top of their game night in and night out and like it's not an excuse that carries on for very long but like it, it's hard because like literally no other players have ever gone through a situation like this nobody in a globally has ever gone through anything like this so it's just hard to for anybody to be on their game 100%. That being said, okay, that's an excuse for this one. You have to get better. Like, you can't just keep doing this either. And I think we would agree they did get better. Four days later, after a four-day break, they took on, on the 18th, the uh, Florida Panthers. And a big Calgary win here against a top team in the league, a 5-1 win over the Panthers, ending the Flames losing streak at four. Matt, I don't know about you, but it looked to me like the Flames set the tone early in this one, and they really won every area you can win in this game. Yeah, and Florida coming into this was red hot. Like, they had scored 50 goals in their last eight games, which since 92 had only been eclipsed once. So, like, it's been a very impressive run for the Panthers the last eight games heading into that one. And... The Flames, to their credit, just absolutely shut the door on the face of the Panthers and did not really give anything. And even when Sam Bennett drawed the game to within one, the Flames responded pretty much right away, putting more pressure on and eventually scoring the the Monaghan goal and didn't look back. And they just kept going until the game got way out of hand for the Flames and... You know, you just wait for the clock to end I was even point. noticing here in the first five minutes that the breakouts were looking so much better than the game before. Like, they just came out with structure and purpose in this one. The Flames, because, like, they do not have a McDavid or a Dreisaitl or, you know, insert name of superstar here. Like, they, in order for them to be successful, they have to do all the little nitpicky things right in order to consistently be consistent and win. And... Like, we saw that for the first, like, until uh, the Anaheim game in Anaheim last month, where, like, they were playing that way every game, and it was consistent, and they were way out in front and first in the conference. And then after that, things started getting away from them, and the lack of attention to detail crept in, and they went to 7-1. and one. Uh, and like that's not a good stretch and you know for this team to respond in a positive manner they have to get back to what made them successful which is all the little details and the physical play and like against the Panthers they were very emotionally involved they were pushing and shoving and scrums and all sorts of nastiness throughout the game which is what they need they need in order to be like having their head in the game and focused playing on the like not overdoing it side of the ledger but engaged enough where like it's actually making a difference yeah that's a good way to put it um 
Johnny Gaudreau has four points this one, all assists. The goals come from Rasmus Anderson, Blake Coleman, Sean Monaghan, Matthew Kachuk, and Monaghan again. Can you remember a game this season where Monaghan looked as good as he did in this one? Well, the thing is, is that Monaghan throughout his career for the first couple months of the season has generally has looked poor, regardless of, like, right from his rookie year on, except for that one year that he, 18-19, uh, where he had, like, all those, uh, like, his career year. Um, it's one of those things that, like, in addition to playing better defensively uh, and learning how to play better defensively, um, the slow start with the offense didn't really surprise me. But now that he's engaging more, like, you starting to see him actually throw hits and pushing and shoving after whistles, which he didn't really do before, and he's starting to become a more complete 200-foot player, and I think that you're starting to see the positive work from that bleed into other things, and more recently, since the about the beginning of December, you've started to see the points come more liberally uh, to the point where he's closing in on like pretty much his career norm of uh, like what his normal production is. And it'll be interesting to see uh, moving forward like if he's able to reestablish himself as that top six center. And you know, it could have just been a good game. Yeah, oh, for sure. It could just be an isolated, hey, he he wanted to take it to Florida, and he did. Because he does do good against the Panthers. I, I don't think that's his first two-goal game against the Panthers, if I recall correctly. But um, it it's one of those things, though, that uh, uh, it was interesting, that goal with Kachuk and Gaudreau, though, um, that it gives the Flames another option. Because if that actually works with Monaghan on that line. Lindholm is a very capable two-way player in his own right. You could potentially spread the wealth there and create a very dangerous second line uh, using Lindholm as the catalyst on that line with Manjapane. So, you know, like, there are ways of potentially getting more out of the various components on the team potentially it, it yes yeah i to just don't want to rush them back to the oh no goudreau no of course not but it's one of those that if it's in the wheelhouse and you know like say like uh, the game it's like zero zero or one nothing halfway through the game and nothing's really clicking it, at least it gives an option of well hey that clicked against the panthers maybe you know, try it out for a few shifts and see if it works. And, you know, it just gives another option, which, you know, up to this point hasn't really been a viable option. So, you know, it, and frankly, like, if Monaghan can recover some or most of what he was as a player, then, like, that's basically like a trade deadline acquisition right there let alone like actual trade deadline acquisitions so i was gonna say or it could also lead to a trade deadline acquisition of somebody else true and like and like that's where like if you're getting that uh like if you say moved lindholm down a line you would be able to go get another player add added to that line you know it, like there it just creates more possibilities and like teams that generally are successful in playoff runs, like they need to have six or seven guys that they can count on to generate some offense. And, you know, like up to this point, it's basically just been Manjapane and the current top line of Lindholm, Kachuk, and Gaudreau. And if you can add Monahan to it, well, now you've got five guys. Now, if you can go trade for an, a sixth guy then you've now all of a sudden you've got really good depth scoring with uh, Backlund and Coleman and Dubé, and now your lineup is actually looking very dangerous top to bottom, where before, you know... Well, let's not count our chickens for oh, the no. hatch. Let's, uh, wait no. and see what, let's wait and see what happens this week with, Mon, with Monaghan. Oh, I know. Uh, I'm 
putting the cart a little bit ahead of the horse, but I've been noticing a lot more positives out of Monahan's game over the last month or so. So that's why I wanted to kind of throw it in after he had such a really good game instead of waiting a bit. So with those two games, the Flames have now played 35 games, the lowest in the Pacific Division were five games, I think six games down on the top team, if I remember correctly. I think Anaheim's played 41, um, and we're at 42 points. So we sit fifth right now in the division. 48 points is Vegas at the top. And that's still very attainable. I mean, Matt, if you look at our February schedule, which we'll talk about in a little bit here, um, you know, six points is very attainable for this team. Yeah, like realistically, going three and two over the next five games, like that should We've be got five doable. games in hand, and we're six six points down. Yeah, like that really is realistically should be doable without any real stretch. Um, like it's not like they have to go five and zero oh in order to pass Vegas or something like that. Like the Flames did bank a lot of points, and like while they did struggle like over the past month um it, it's one of those where they're still in a very good position their hot just start like, really helped them yeah and like that's why like for years i've been advocating like we need to really be good in october because it you know sometimes weird stuff happens and you know like this last month and a half it's been very bizarre <laughs> and you know it, 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 buy, it buys you that time to not have to stress yeah, because, like, you know, like, if, say, the Flames were, like, having their typical first two months of the season and then went three, uh, three, seven, and one, like, the Flames would be, like, down with Chicago and Edmonton or worse and, like, down with Seattle and uh, Arizona and we're talking about trading Gaudreau and, like, rebuilding at this point. And, like, that's literally the difference, just that hot start. Now, like, this team is looking still poised to be a top team in this division and league and, you know, push things forward and see how it goes. Well, the... Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you there. Um, the Flames have announced, or I should say the league has announced their February schedule. And while we're talking about, you know, getting guys like Monaghan going, there's going to be a lot of games to do that now. Uh, we've lost 10 games. Most of them were at home. And, Matt, when I saw the February schedule today, the first thought I had was, that's not bad. What about you? Yeah, like, frankly, the fact that, like, all seven of the makeup games are at home, like, yeah, it's in 13 days, but they don't have the hassle of having to pack all their stuff, get to the airport, get to the new city, unpack, you know, get to the rink, blah, 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 blah. Like, they can just go home come to the rink, practice, play, go home, come to the rink, practice, play. No, there's no added BS, and especially with that many games needing to be made up, like, it's very helpful that they kept those two road games off until the end of April, just so that way things are a little bit more balanced. Well, let's run through this February schedule now. So the Flames are on a small road trip, Dallas, Arizona, which isn't that bad of a trip on the 1st and 2nd of February. Then they have really six days off before the next home game. So, I mean, let's just assume they don't leave right after the Arizona game and they leave the next day on the 3rd. You could be back in your own bed then by Friday. So that would give the Flames one, two, three, four, five days before they have a game. And then we don't have these weird... You know, breaks we have now, like you were saying earlier, five games, you know, five days, six days where the team's sitting idle. They're pretty much playing regularly after that. They have a back to back at home, Vegas and Toronto on the 9th and 10th, then a day off, then the Islanders, then two days off, then a back to back Columbus Anaheim, two days off Seattle, day off Winnipeg, two days off, a quick trip to Vancouver, and then they're back here against Minnesota on the 26th. The new games are February 9th versus Vegas. February 10th versus Toronto, February 12th versus the New York Islanders, February 15th versus Columbus Blue Jackets, February 16th versus uh, Anaheim Mighty Ducks or Anaheim Ducks. Um, the 19th of February, Seattle's first game in the Dome in the regular season. And the 21st would be the Winnipeg Jets uh, in the Dome, 24th at Vancouver, and the 26th versus Minnesota. So, very doable and still i mean when they're playing you know three games in four nights and they get a bit of a break after that so it's 
I think of all the bad schedules that you could have had, getting a whole bunch of home games canceled, really it's turning out okay. Like you said, they're not going to be jet setting in the month of February. No, and it just makes life a little easier. And, like, yes, the team needs to actually, you know, win those games, but at least they're setting themselves up to make the conditions as favorable as possible. And even this Vancouver game on the 24th, they can leave the morning of and come back that night if they wanted to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Easily. So, you know, I mean, when I look at this, do I really like having two back-to-backs two weeks in a row? No, but with the break times they have before it, before the first one, they have six days of a break, and before the second one, they have two days. I think the team can be ready for those in that, you know, in both of those scenarios. Not like you're playing... A back-to-back, then a game, then a day, then a back-to-back, or something like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, at at least... Yeah. It's still going to be tough, but it's a lot more doable than, you know, if they were bouncing back and forth between, like, here and, like, having to go to Anaheim or whatever. Like, it just... It makes so much more sense. And when you look at this month, I think it's going to be a pretty important month for this team, too. I mean, beating Vegas will be important. Hopefully, the Flames will be able to, to have uh, more than half their fans in the stands for Toronto, because Toronto always sells out. Um, I think Anaheim will be important to pick up those points. Seattle's going to be important to pick up some points. Winnipeg will be important. Vancouver. Like, most of this month is against, you know, Western Conference teams and even divisional rivals that we got to pick up some points from. Yeah, well, like, even if you look at the end of January, like, uh, four of the five games are against conference opponents, and then, like, basically everybody except for uh, Toronto, the Islanders, and Columbus are also conference games. Like, you know, we're getting... We've already pretty much got through all of the Eastern teams that we play. Like, uh, there's four games next... uh, in March that are against Eastern teams, and... Other than that, like, that's it. Like, everything else is Western Conference. Yeah. And, you know, like, it, it, there's and only... a lot of home games from here on out. Yeah. Like, only eight games left against the East, and, you know, how many ever... Uh, 43, so 35 games against uh, Western Conference opponents. Like, it, it, now we're, we're into the fun part of the schedule where, uh, yeah, we have to actually kick some butt. Yeah, when I was looking at, you know, the time the Flames had off in February and the number of games they had to make up, I thought this is pretty doable. And if the league does this correctly, it's not going to be that onerous on the team. And, I mean, again, I don't know what arena conditions there are. Obviously, to have a six-day break there, there's probably something going on with one of the arenas or our arena. But, you know, I mean, could I have spaced it out better? Sure, but I don't know all the conditions. But I think, you know, probably everything considered... It's not going to be a bad schedule for these guys. No, and, like, even in April when you've got, uh, like, the two added games, like, it, yeah, there's a three-game and four-night uh, situation with Arizona here and then going to Chicago and uh, to Nashville. But, like, even that's not an overly onerous trip. Like, Chicago and Nashville are fairly close uh, in terms of geological distance. So it's not like it's a huge, you know, it's like going from uh, Edmonton to Vancouver. Like, it's not that big a deal. And Yeah, and, and even on that road trip, you're talking with the 18th, 19th there they've added. I mean, you can, you've got home games on either side of it, so you can, you know, leave late and come back early. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's not that huge of a deal. So, um, yeah, no, and, like, even though April's schedule's rather busy with, uh, it is now. 15 games in 29 days. Like, you know, it's going to be a busy marathon sprint. You're get your trade but... deadline value that month. Yeah, exactly. And when is the trade deadline specifically? I want to say March 21st. Okay, yeah. Yeah, which I would still leave 20 games in total uh, after the deadline. So, like, you know, a good quarter of the season. That's a lot of games if, you know. Yeah, the Flames don't get their business done early uh, in terms of the trade deadline. Like they'll still have plenty of games left again, you know, to bring any new people in. 
So if you had tickets for one of these games that got rescheduled, you've heard the schedule now. Make sure you go and check Ticketmaster for or wherever you bought tickets for updates and to see the updated schedule. But yeah, I, I think this is very doable and it's going to keep the guys busy. And I think right now that's what we need. We just need these guys busy and, and playing. And I think in this case, you're going to be playing or practicing every day. You're not going to have huge lumps of time off to get distracted. You know, like uh, the Flames, uh, they tend to perform better when they're on a roll. And like, if you look in uh, October, like they were playing virtually every other day. Uh, November was a very busy month uh, with uh, 14 games in 29 days. You know, like it, it, you know, it was a very busy schedule for them, and they were able to roll over teams because like they just kept the momentum going. And, you know, you look into, uh, like, basically since uh, COVID, uh, you know, they've only played, like, uh, eight games since uh, December 29th. Like, that's not very many comparatively. And, you know, it, it'll be a lot better for the team if they're, like once they're actually back into the swing of things and March and April are going to be busy with, you know, some games at home, some games on the road. I think if there's a month, this team might put together a pretty good win streak. It's going to be February. Yeah. Uh, well, also, um, uh, with, uh, them having so much time off, uh, cause like the, the eight games between the 29th and the 21st, um, you know, like that's for them to actually like, physically recover from covid and like get their endurance back up like playing that few games actually is a huge benefit to the Could team been, yeah uh, just because like if they had been coming back and like having to play every other game like right from the get-go like they might have run into some serious conditioning issues and like just the space has allowed them just that little bit more time to be able to prepare themselves in a physical manner against the upcoming opponents. Yep, I agree. And speaking of February, we've got the All-Star Game coming up and something we need to talk about there. Um, what day is the All-Star Game? I don't even have the date for that. Well, I'm assuming it's... Uh, February uh, the, 5th. Yeah. Oh, that's... That's part of the reason they have such a long break there, because they've got uh, t days on on either side of the All-Star game. So uh, February 5th is the All-Star game. I knew it was sometime early February. It was supposed to be before they went to the Olympics. Um, and the Flames sending one player, oh, the only play Flames player going this year, Johnny Goudreau, I think probably the Flames player that everybody around the league knows, which makes sense when it's league-wide voting. Matt, do you feel like maybe Markstrom got snubbed this year? Uh, a little bit but not overly shocked. Um, Anybody else in the roster you thought would be there that's, that you're surprised isn't? Uh, possibly Kachuk. That, it, Mark Sherman and Kachuk were the only two, really, that I thought could have been viable people. But I thought Kachuk would have been there. Yeah. It's one of those things that like the whole all-star format is a little screwed up like you have Nazim Kadri who's one of the top scorers in the entire NHL and he's not even there so it's like um well let's talk about that for a bit so I mean you know there's been a lot of talk about the NHL game for years ever since what was it John Scott made it um, yeah. because the flan fans voted him in and this fan voting thing and I know a lot of sports are feeling this way but I'm starting to feel like the NHL all-star game is a bit of an antique I think and a time when you didn't see a lot of the players. I mean, there was a time when we only played one division in the East every year. And there's a time when uh, it was hard to see players in other markets. And I think in the streaming age we live in, in the age of NHL game availability, I think that the, the allure of the All-Star game is going away a little bit, where it's like, oh, I don't get to see so-and-so, or I don't get to see so-and-so. And I'm starting to wonder if maybe the best thing to do is just bring the guys in, do a skills comp, and call it a weekend. Well, like, even, uh, like, uh, with the skills competition, like, to me, like, that would make sense to have that as, like, your participation trophy, like, where everybody gets a representative in the skills competition, and then, you know, like, when it comes to the actual game, have, like, the good players, you know, like, w where you're not having a guy like Nazim Kadri who's in the top six in scoring, 
or top five, and he's not even there. Like, uh, like that's just. See, when it, you're talking about the the participation trophy, remember when the Flames used to do their own skills competition in the dome? What I could almost see doing that is have every team run their own in their own market, and every team sends their event winner. Yeah, exactly. Like that. There was one year in like uh, I want to say '99 or 2000. When the Flames, uh, for the skills competition, sent Ed Ward for their hardest shot. And, like, that, that, you know, and that, to me, makes a lot more sense. Where, you know, like, if you have somebody who's just fast, like how Matthew Lombardi used to be that blazing fast, even though he was not that good of a player, you know, he should have been able to showcase his speed and have the best skaters against the best skaters or the best shooters against the best shooters. Where, you know, like, the rest of their game might not be very good, necessarily. But, like, they're exceptional at that one thing. And I think that... How would you say? It's also making the game more marketable in terms of, like... It's not just Ovechkin and McDavid. Like, there are other players that can do, like, all these extraordinary things in addition to you know like the superstars like i feel like with the nhl back in the olympics and the world cup potentially coming back i feel like we have enough chance to show best on best and for the fans to get behind some i don't know anybody that says wow i'm team pacific but people get behind canada the states or sweden like i think those are much better fan events to see best on best yeah i agree the only ways I could see the All-Star game going is get rid of the uh, fan participation and do it one of two ways. Pick players purely on points. So you pick a date, the guys who have the most points go at that point. And if we did that, the Pacific Division this year would look very different. We'd have Leon Dreisaitl, Connor McDavid, Johnny Goudreau, Timo Meyer, JT Miller, um, Quinn Hughes, Brent Burns, and Shea Theodore would be our Pacific Division. The other way I could see doing it would be um, maybe picking guys even based on the previous season stats. So, like, send the guys who are the best from the previous season to go. That that gets all dicey with injuries and stuff, but I just I don't know that this best on best in a game that a lot of the guys don't seem to want to be there for anyways. We see guys opt out of. Like, it's just... I remember when I was a kid, nobody opted out of the All-Star game. And well, now, like, how many times has Ovechkin skipped the All-Star game? Yeah, I mean, back when I was a kid, I remember, you know, you'd have Gretzky and Lemieux and Lindros and all those guys. Nobody skipped it. You know, nobody of value anyways. And now it seems like the guys would rather not be there. If you want to reward the players for doing well, maybe you give them, instead of an all-star game, sort of do it the the uh, NFL and send them somewhere exotic like Hawaii or somewhere like that to do a skills comp or to just, you know, do something fun for the weekend. Yeah. Like, there are plenty of permutations that would make things a lot more interesting, generally. Like, even back, uh, like, when they used to have, like, the young players playing in, like, that mini game. Didn't they do, what was it? It was in the afternoon, they had, like, a Young Stars game, and then they had yeah. the All-Stars game. And do you remember when they did North America versus the World in the All-Star game? Yeah. Like, there are plenty of different ways to shake things up, and... You know, it's... And even before that, it used to be that it was the host team versus the NHL All-Stars. Yeah. It just seems like it, things have gotten a little stale and they just need to be shaken up again. Like, they've used the same format for, I think, five or six years now. You know, and yeah. maybe we can combine some of the NHL's uh, sort of events. Like, I could see the All-Star game being the outdoor game. Mm-hmm. That, to me, would make sense. Instead of often we get these two teams that nobody cares about playing wearing silly jerseys outside, why don't we just put the All-Stars on the outdoor game and sort of kill bird, two birds with one stone? Yeah. I agree. You know, or, yeah, do some of that. And I know, I mean, even when we've had our outdoor games, I think for most fans, more than the outdoor game itself, I, I know just, you know, you and I have talked about it and I've talked about it with other fans, it's been the alumni games and, like, the AHL games and oh, yeah. all the, the other festivities that people actually care about. So maybe maybe that's what the All-Star game becomes. I mean, maybe that's when Gretzky dusts off the skates and comes back for a night. Or maybe it's an All-Star alumni versus that town's alumni. Yeah. And or, it's just or, the NHL know. guys doing a skills comp. Yeah, or even uh, something a little more drastic where, you know, maybe have, uh, like, some veteran NHLers against the current guys for, like, a skills competition. 
or something, or like mix yeah. the team, or mix the teams up possibly. Well, and, and they used to do a celebrity game too. Like there would be the uh, I think it was the alumni versus celebrities. That could be a way to go. Or if you want to get the celebrities involved, do you remember? I don't know if they still do it, but the WHL used to do Team Cherry versus Team Or. Uh, yeah. Maybe you have former NHLers who sort of pick their own team instead of the fans picking it. Like, I just, I don't know that the game itself is the important part of the weekend for most people. And I don't know if it's the most important part for the players. Either that, you've got to attach something to it more than money. I think, yeah. you know, in, in baseball, it's what is it, the winning team gets home field advantage in the um, World Series. Yeah. In the World Series. So, you know, maybe there's something else you can attach to it. Yeah, it, it's just, it's one of those where it's kind of just boring, frankly. And It is. I mean, I'll be honest, as a kid, I watched every year, and I can't remember the last time I watched an All-Star game. Yeah. I watched the John Scott one just because I was cheering for John Scott, because it was hilarious. But, you know. And, you know, maybe that's the way to go. Instead of having an All-Star game, maybe call it the NHL Fan Picks game. And fans can pick anybody they want to send, and that player goes. Yeah. Or maybe, like you said, it's sort of the undiscovered stars. Everybody sends somebody in their bottom six or their bottom two on defense, and those guys, you're not going to sell as many tickets there. But like I don't know, they've just they've got to change things up somehow because it just it feels boring. It almost feels like, to me, anyways, it feels like the All Star game just going through the motions, sort of the Flames in that Ottawa game. Yeah. And, you know, like, uh, you rarely see anybody actually trying hard. Like, um, the last one, the only team that was actually trying hard was the Pacific team because they were trying to raise money for ALS research, and uh, the Flames players kind of spurred that on because the winning team got, like, a $100,000 bonus or something like that. And so, you know, the the. Pacific Division seemed to be the only one that was actually treating it seriously because of that. And, you know, like, it, it's just like one you, of those things where, like, they're, they need to figure some way of getting more out of it. And, like I said, I think that today it's less about seeing the stars of other markets. I think it'd be great if every team did their own skills comp and then we had the best of those take on each other. I could even see, I think there's more desire now, too, to learn about the players off the ice. Like This might sound silly, but seven all-star game, have all the all-stars go play Family Feud for a week or something. Like, put that on and, you know, see these guys off the ice doing something fun or silly for the fans. Yeah. You know, have them all star on the Price is Right or something for NHL week. Like, I just, there's got to be something to me as a player. Well, Why do it, I want to well, go play it, another it would, hockey game? It would depend on who you're sending, though. Because if you got Drysidle involved, then you know he's just going to chew off the host, you know, for whatever reason, and then you know be called pissy about it. You're so. playing Plinko. Why do you have to be so pissy? Yeah, you know, just drop the the Plinko chip. Jeez. That's right. <laughs> um. <laughs> Well, you know, they could, they could ask Drysdale the Family Feud question. Name five reporters who think you're pissy. Leon, you're up first. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, just something that's not hockey. Like, I can understand it as a hockey player. I don't know if I want to play another hockey game. No. And often the All-Star game is either at the... I mean, we've always had sort of the bye weeks before or after. Often these guys are going to Vegas with their families, and then they're going somewhere else afterwards. Like maybe it well, needs to be. Well, you know, it's like that uh, one year where like uh, they were having the players getting picked, uh, uh, you know, by oh, like I remember drafted. That. Yeah, the team and captains would like, pick their players, and like Ovechkin was sitting clearly drunk and sitting on Giordano's lap. Like that was hilarious. I forget who it was, but there's one year they did that, and the last guy picked. Um, Ovechkin came over with his camera and took a picture of the poor sucker to make fun of him yeah, for being the Phil, last guy. Yeah, Phil Kessel. Was it Kessel? Yeah. You know, so maybe there's things like that. Or, I mean, you know, not as fun for the fans, but maybe just say, hey, you guys are the all-stars. The NHL is going to send you and your family for an all-expenses weekend at Disney just to reward you for your hard work this year. Yeah, anything. Like, it, it, they need to shake something up and, you know, make it fun. Instead of, you know, like, it's supposed to be a fun weekend, but it's just, it's kind of like going through the motions and like, oh yes, this is what we're doing this weekend, yay. And like I said, if we're going to do the World Cup again every two years, I think maybe just use that as your all-star game. Yeah. 
Like, I don't know any fans that go, wow, Team Pacific, great. But people get excited for Team Canada, Team USA, Team Russia. So let fans not only get behind their player, but let them get behind their country. Team under 23s. <laughs> That's right. Or, you know, and I know the NHL would never do it, but even if you could have the all-star team play an all-star team of the rest of the world, like let the KHL, the SHL, all those guys put together an all-star team to play one NHL all-star team, that to me would be interesting. Yeah, because then you would actually have the NHL versus the world, and like that would yeah. be cool. But the NHL would hate the publicity if they got beat. Yeah, exactly. And in that case, you've got not you got every – well. Yeah, the other team would expect to be beat. Like, if you're the KHL, you got nothing to lose and everything to gain. Yeah, exactly. SHL, same thing. The And that's uh, where you'd never see it happen. <laughs> yeah, the Finnish Liga. So, I don't know. I mean, the other the other interesting thing could be maybe have the NHL All-Stars play the HL All-Stars. or Like, I just I don't know what the answer is, but it needs to change. Yeah. And I think I would rather celebrate in our market or maybe have All-Star games within your division. Yeah. And, and you know, if you had – and if they want to make money, it would be a tougher sell. But what if every division had its own all-star game and it's hosted by an in-division team? So there's, what, seven teams per division now? You Everybody hosts it once every seven years. Yeah. You know, and it's just – I mean, it's – the only downside is the players you see all the time, right? Because it would be your – uh, Pacific Division All Stars. Yeah, and it would be a random draft of like take the two highest scoring players in that division. They're the captains, and they pick the rest of the team. Yeah, or again, maybe it's you know the the fans of the of the team that's hosting it gets to pick, or it's their team versus. Yeah, I don't know. There's lots of ways to do it. Yeah, I just I don't know. I'm I'm getting bored of the All Star game, and like you said, there's guys that should be there and aren't. I think we've said that every year, and I think there's guys that are there that you know maybe shouldn't be yeah um and it's just i mean if it, if we want to be fan voting great but then don't call it an all-star game call it the fans choice or something like that yeah and lean into that and oh, i would yeah. love to then see guys like john scott get in there because some fan base took it upon themselves to get that guy there you know i mean if our fan base wanted to go and say let's get um, Eric, oh yeah or let's let's get brad richardson there like you know, and, and we want to do that campaign. Let's do it. Let's you know, let fans almost get into that, and maybe make the weekend more about the fans. Who has the best fan base? How do we measure that? Like, I don't know. Yeah. You know, which fan base got the most votes for their player, and maybe that you know, that fan base gets something, or I don't know. It's uh, you and I could sit here and brainstorm all night, but I, I think that it just it needs to change. Yeah. And I, I don't know how, but I'm just it, I, I don't think it's an all star game anymore. And if guys don't want to go, then maybe we should shut her down. Yeah. I'd be curious to know how much the league actually makes off that game. Like, is it a profit center or is it probably a few million dollars? Because you got to figure all the merchandise and such that they sell that are just. And, specific to that and could you replace that merchandise with something like a world cup every year or every two years or i don't know yeah like to me i would never buy an all-star jersey i don't care i'm i would buy a team canada jersey if they were ever nice again um so i'm thinking there's probably more revenue to be gained that way yeah well i did buy uh the gray and uh red the uh, Flames All Star jersey, but it was also on sale. So, actually, I shouldn't say I'd never buy one. If there was ever an All Star game again in Calgary and there was a Flames player in it, yeah, maybe. definitely, yeah. Maybe then I'd buy it, but who knows if we'll ever host an All Star game again? The only other ones I would consider buying were the ones that were like ninety four through ninety seven, the ones that look like the big star. Hmm. But often the All Star jerseys are just goofy too. Like they're not something you'd want to add to your collection. No, like the only uh, jersey that for the All Star game that I thought was really good was the O three O O three O four O two O three, the one that was hosted in Minnesota with like the very retro look. I thought those ones were sharp. But you know, oh yeah, where they had like the gray or like the off white. Hmm. And then the, there was a couple years here we had these goofy striped jerseys. Like 2020, we had these goofy 
yeah. striped jerseys. Yeah. Or like, the, I don't know, it just... Or the one uh, in, in St. Louis where it was, like, on a musical sheet and the logo oh, yeah, yeah, is yeah. the note thing, and, yeah, just dumb-looking, but... Yeah. And, and that's the other thing, too. It's like, well, how much are we actually making selling these atrocities? So, I, I don't know. I gotta imagine there's, there's ways to make that up. Mm. Who knows? You and I are not the commissioner. We're too tall to be the commissioner. Matt, I think we're pretty much done for uh, Flame Stuff this week. Is there anything else that's pressing that we need to talk about? Uh, not really. Uh, it's just uh, the last game was encouraging, and hopefully this week we see a little bit more of that and less of like the Ottawa and the three previous games. And, and now we're doing what we do best as Flames fans this season, and we're waiting again. Exactly. You know, we have another three-day break between the Florida game and the Oilers game, and, you know, we get to go back, take another nap, and, you know. <laughs> it gives the Oilers some time to regroup and figure out what they can do to, to right their wrongs. Yeah. The one good thing is is that with that Flames win yesterday, um, it really made the Florida Panthers angry and frustrated, which, you know, when you're – their their next opponent is the Edmonton Oilers. There's nothing better than sending an angry, frustrated, pissed off team up there. And they'll get there before we do. Yep. Well, let's talk about this week then. So as you mentioned, uh, we're recording on the 19th. It'll be the 19th, 20th, 21st, no game. Then we make a quick road trip up to Edmonton for Hockey Night in Canada on Saturday. The Flames are back in the Dome on the 24th. And you and I will be recording at a different time next week. Instead of recording Wednesday night, we're going to do a Tuesday night recording. So we'll do the 25th because the Flames play their first Wednesday game of the season. And we thought we were pretty safe doing Wednesdays. Now, February, we're going to be recording all over the place. But we'll get to that scheduling change when we get there. Uh, so we have two games for we record next. An 8 p.m. against Edmonton and a 7 p.m. against the St. Louis Blues. What are you thinking, uh, Matt? Well, you see, best laid plans, you know, we started out, we chose Wednesday instead of, like, Sunday or Monday because usually... Those are the days that have the fewest games. And so, oh, Wednesday, there's only one this year. Awesome. And now there's like five. And there's no <laughs> Sundays in February. Yeah, exactly. So we'll figure out the schedule at some point in the very immediate future and let everybody know. But, yeah, it's a little bit bizarre. We'll Might probably end up having to go week by week and just let people know week by week what we're doing. Yeah. We'll see. It, it'll be odd. One way or the now other. that the NHL's part of their schedule, now we have to figure out ours. Exactly. Well, Matt, two games this week. What are you thinking? Well, St. Louis is a very good team. And the Oilers have two good players. I'm going to say 2-0. and oh. um, I think that Calgary, um, it, you know, like with that game against Florida, I think that... Uh, I'm assuming that, like, after the Ottawa game, that Daryl kind of laid into him a bit. I think the coaching staff's going to tell him, you got to prove you can do better against a lousy team. And, and, you know, frankly, the Oilers are the third worst team in the conference right now. And they, like us, have a bunch of games in hand, but, you know, they're also terrible. So, you know, there's that. Uh, but, you know, the Flames need to... You know, like, the Oilers are struggling just as much as Calgary was before the Florida game. And Calgary needs to find a way to make sure that they play their game against the Oilers and not... That first game of the season, it, like, uh, that one, it seemed like the Flames were trying too hard to hit the Oilers and not focusing on details, which allowed McDavid to get the hat trick. And I think that, like, in order for the Flames to be successful in this game against the Oilers, that, like, yeah, you can engage physically, but I think that if they go too far down that road, that they'll get off their own game and start making mistakes, which McDavid and Drysaddle could capitalize on. And I think it would be more advantageous for them to play a slightly more patient and thoughtful defensive game instead of. Uh, trying to uh, crash and bash and possibly take penalties to set up situations for those two to actually do anything. And I think if they can manage to both contain their emotions yet play with emotion and, you know, 
attentive to details than they should beat the Oilers. And St. Louis, frankly, they're a tough team just like the Florida Panthers are, but the Flames need to show that they can actually beat good Western Conference teams, which they have not really had the best. No, and they've got uh, the Blues twice in a week. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, like you, they need to be able to show that, yeah, okay, that, that's great that you're second in the conference behind the Avalanche. Good for you. Uh, we're still going to bloody your nose and take the two points off of you. I think that with the Oilers' goaltending issues, the Flames, if they play their game like we saw in Florida, I think they could really run up that score like they did against Florida. Koskinen's no good. Um, Smith Skinner's is, out. Yeah, Smith's, Smith's out. I don't even know who they've got behind Koskinen. Doesn't really matter. Pick you know anybody and put them there. Um, so I think the Flames... The Flames could run up that score. I think that could be a high-scoring game. I don't think the Blues game is going to be high score. I can see that being like a 2-1 to one or something like that. But I think that game is just about the Flames playing their game. And, I mean, with two games and three nights, they don't have that long break that they've had. So I think it's about, you know, picking up that momentum in Edmonton and ro- rolling it in St. Louis. Yeah. like to Or me, against St. Louis, I should say. Yeah, like to me, it's imperative that they get at least two points this week. Ideally, get four points. I'm going to go the same as you. I I've put this down even before you said yours. I'm going to go uh, two wins. I think they can beat Edmonton. I think they have to beat Edmonton, and I think they can beat St. Louis. I think it might be an overtime win against St. Louis, but I think uh, they can beat St. Louis. Yeah, like frankly, if it's an overtime game, regardless if it's uh, versus Edmonton or St. Louis. It doesn't really matter. Like, it it matters a little bit against Edmonton, but um, it's very much a doable and containable situation because the Oilers are so far behind. Um, Yeah, you can drop the point to Edmonton if you need to. I mean, just for pride's sake, I want us to close that out in 60. Oh, of course, yeah. But, you know, it, it would be nice to... Uh, make sure that they get the two points, regardless of how it comes in each game. I mean, if we're if we're talking about pride, I guess the the best possible option would be that we play twenty and they forfeit, but that's not happening. So we'll close out in sixty. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No, I I think the Blues game is going to be a struggle, and the Blues game is really going to let us see. I mean, I don't think the Flames look great against the three top Eastern teams they took on earlier this month. So I think the Blues game is going to let us see really where they are now. And that'll um, be their best test, I think, since Tampa. Well, frankly, like, if you look at the Western Conference teams versus the Eastern Conference teams, like, realistically, amongst the top, top, top teams, like, it's really basically the only Colorado Avalanche and then the Eastern teams. And, you know, like, yeah, Calgary has been doing well, but, you know, like it, it's hard to gauge exactly like at what you know. Like, are the Flames like one of the better teams in a really bad conference, or you know, are they a legit team? And you know, when they're facing other top teams from this conference, like St. Louis, they need to be able to show that like not only are they able to get the two points, but be visibly better than the other team and. You know, we haven't really seen that thus far, but, you know, we'll just have to wait and see. And Calgary needs to start getting that momentum rolling, especially as, like, the games are starting to appear more frequently on the schedule. Yeah, and there's there's only so much more time that we can not play well before we're going to start slipping in the standings. I mean, you talked about earlier that, you know, that good start bought them some time. But they're also running out of you know bought time from the er- from early in the season. Exactly, and like you're, they're getting to a point where like they're basically catching up on their games in hand, and you know like you know uh, with the next five games heading into like the end of next week, like uh, three of them are against bad teams. Like Vancouver, Edmonton, and Columbus are not very good, and then a pair against St. Louis. You know like. Realistically, the Flames need to be able to show that, it, A, they can beat those three bad teams, but also hold the fort against the good ones. And, you know, then into next month, it's more both mediocre and good teams kind of splitting the time. Yeah, no, I, I think you're, you're totally right. 
Well, Matt, I think that's about it for, for the Flames this week. We'll see if they can come away with four points and put themselves back near the top of the Pacific Division. Yep, and as always, go Flames, go. And at least we weren't pissy. That's true. At least we respect our reporters here in Calgary. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.